Andy Kane, are you there? Oh, that's right. I don't mean my Andy Kane. I mean yours. Aw, oh, come on. Prank calls are like a rite of passage for children of the 80s and 90s. The ritual of hanging out at a friend's house on a Saturday night when you're a kid usually included at least one or two calls to unsuspecting households with immature and entertaining interactions. A family member dies and you insult me. What the hell is the matter with you anyway? Uh, uh, uh. Sounds harmless enough, right? Well, mostly. But what if the person you prank called turned out to be a sadistic serial killer with limited patience for practical jokes and even less patience for unruly young people who waste his time and give him the dreaded blue balls? Get him going, get him all worked up, and then in the middle of it, say, hey, guess what? I'm a dude. That is the premise for 2001's Joyride, a horror thriller about a pair of brothers and their childhood friend who are making their way cross country when a road trip prank gone wrong results in a relentless weekend of death, car chases, sabotage, and even a bit of pink champagne. Pink champagne. So much you like pink champagne. It's a movie that plays on the classic teen slasher moodiness while also substituting blood and guts for more subtle haunts, like the monotone and rough voice of the killer being the main terrifier of the story. I need to find Candy Cane. The movie opens with Lewis Thompson, played by a newly famed Paul Walker, as he buys a car following his first year at Berkeley and plans to drive all the way from California to Colorado to pick up his girlfriend Venna, played by Lily Sobieski, and take her back home for the summer. When Lewis gets a call that his older brother Fuller, played by the criminally underrated Steve Zahn, was arrested in Utah, Lewis takes a detour to collect his brother before the two head to Colorado. Listen, this is my pledge to you. You will not be seeing me again. Two strikes are enough for Fuller Thomas. The characters introduced in this movie are definitely tropey, but I think for this kind of movie, it is kind of perfect. We have Lewis as the young, innocent straight man, Fuller as the edgy and less put together comic relief, and a series of roadside hick cops and diner employees to build out this rural highway environment. I'm thinking that taking a little look-see might refresh your memory. Little has been reported about the production of this film, but the director, John Dahl, who you would know as the director of Rounders and several episodes of Showtime's Dexter, has gone on record stating that the film consists of many endings which have been since seen by fans of the film on the movie's DVD release. Make sure you stick around to the end of the video because we are going to be talking about all of them. While on the road, Fuller buys Lewis a CB radio as a gag gift for their trip. The two immediately begin tinkering around with the device until Fuller has the brilliant idea to make a prank call out to a lonely truck driver who goes by the handle Rusty Nail. He convinces Lewis to put on a woman's voice and seduce the truck driver over the radio, which is equal parts mean-spirited and entertaining for the two boys. You know what makes it easier sometimes is, is pretending the person that I'm talking to is right next to me. The voice of the man they prank call is the sandy and gravelly voice of actor Ted Levine, who also starred in The Fast and the Furious with Paul Walker that same year. While Ted Levine isn't credited in the movie, you would recognize his voice immediately if you've seen him in any film. You see, you might not be kidding, but I am. That's the point. Rusty Nail is never fully identified, but he seems to take quite a liking to Lewis under his CB radio prank call alias, Candy Cane. <laughs> I, I take off your bra. Oh, okay, you, you take that off. It gets a little too real for the boys, and they cut the conversation off, thinking that that's the end of it. But, oh, oh man, it's not the end of it. Like, not even a little. Anybody out there know Candy Cane? When the brothers stop off at a roadside motel for the night, Fuller has a small but harmless altercation with a fellow patron of the motel and decides that the best revenge would be to invite their new CB radio friend over to meet with his beloved candy cane. They call him on the radio and invite him to the room of the customer that Fuller had beef with, which is right next to their own room. 
The plan is for the truck driver to show up with a bottle of pink champagne and be extremely surprised and embarrassed when the person he visits is just a regular dude and not candy cane. So, wait, 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 wait. Is this a prank on the dude that Fuller had beef with, or is this a prank on the truck driver who, up until this point, didn't do anything to deserve this? I don't know, but don't feel too bad because it turns out this truck driver is a violent serial killer that deserves much worse than a few prank calls. So things begin getting increasingly scary for the brothers as they discover that the truck driver has killed the man in the hotel room, and the police are nowhere near catching him. When they hit the road and head towards Denver to pick up Venna, they start receiving CB radio calls from Rusty Nail, who is now taunting them and looking for Candy Cane. I think that you can tell me where to find her. Of course, we know that Candy Cane is just Paul Walker with a third-rate female voice, and thanks to the taunting nature of Fuller's interaction with Rusty, now he knows too. And this... this ain't gonna be good. Pathetic, lonely, walkie-talkie, freak show, motherfucker! Apologize. So, the cat is out of the bag and the two boys have admitted their prank to Rusty, and they think it's all over now, but as it turns out, Rusty is not ready in the slightest to let this one go. He begins harassing the boys from their radio, and as things start to get more and more scary, their only comfort is knowing that their true identities and location are unknown to the lonely truck driver. And then Rusty Nail drops this bomb on them. You really ought to get that fixed. Get what fixed? Your tail light. This line still haunts the absolute shit out of me. Now, we're about halfway through the movie at this point, and our characters are all shaken up. They've caused an innocent man to be attacked, they've completely triggered a psychotic truck driver, and they've gotten no closer to getting themselves home safely. The scene at the midway point where the boys first encounter Rusty Nail is a real edge of your seat type sequence. They get you with the fake outs where you think you see the killer, but it actually turns out to just be like a helpful bystander. Hey. And you get a real confrontation between our guys and the killer. A confrontation that literally made me sigh a breath of relief when Fuller finally apologizes to the truck driver just before the brothers meet their demise. This shit is bananas, people. I'm telling you. Well, I was just playing with you, man. Well, I'd say it's about time something good happened here, seeing as so far it's been mostly doom and gloom. The guys pick up Venna in Colorado and hit the road. At first, it's nothing but a fun and simple road trip adventure. You know, beef jerky and truck stop souvenirs, cheap tequila shots at dive bars, and even a little drunken scuffle at the bar. Bitch, shut up! Are you mouthing off again? Ha <laughs> ha! Well, the good times are rolling, but not for long, as Rusty Nails calls Lewis' hotel room and taunts him once again. We thought the beef was squashed, but when Rusty noticed that the boys are now traveling with a cute young girl that matches the description they gave of Candy Cane, he begins terrorizing the crew more than ever. No, I thought you said there was no girl. What? The motivation of our antagonist in this movie is pretty interesting. See, this guy is obviously a complete monster. I mean, who else would do things this horrific? But it seems that the humiliation of falling for such a juvenile prank is really the driving force here. This is proved by the scene where Rusty Nail kidnaps Venna's friend Charlotte and threatens to kill her if Lewis and Fuller don't go into a diner stark naked and eat six cheeseburgers each, simply because it's embarrassing. You want fries with that? This is probably the least f***ed up thing that he does to these two. When the crew is instructed to travel to a roadside hotel and find Charlotte before she dies, the movie enters its final act. After chasing our main characters through a cornfield in his semi, Rusty Nail is able to kidnap Venna and use her as bait for the boys. You never fully see the killer as he's either obscured by darkness or hiding behind the high beams of his semi, but the voice of Ted Levine is enough to make the movie hinge on this one creepy aspect. It actually makes it much more effective when you can't see the killer. We'll do whatever you want! Meet me at the next town. Medford, room 17. 
Fuller and Lewis are now scouring every motel on the side of the highway trying to find the girls before it's too late. All the while, we see Venna being tied up and the door of her room being rigged with a shotgun that's aimed right at her face. It's here where Fuller gets to redeem his character's rougher edges and complete a full arc as he essentially sacrifices his own safety to save Venna. Don't open the door! Don't open the door! And it's more impactful because we've seen Fuller trying and not doing the best job at being an upstanding character. He's not a bad guy and he's definitely not unlikable, but this scene makes us really root for him. So we go full on Fuller. F full on Fuller. Fuller. I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I know exactly what he says every time he hangs up the phone that I'm the world's biggest loser. So, right in the nick of time, Lewis is able to save his brother and his girlfriend as the police show up to take down the sadistic truck driver. After a shootout, the police stop the truck and discover Charlotte is alive and being held captive inside. Cut to a proper horror cliche ending scene with the main characters sitting in the back of an ambulance while a crane shot captures the final conversation. Only... Hello? Oof, that's right folks, the trucker is still out there and seemingly ready to strike again. And that's the way the movie ends. Except there's also four other versions of this ending that have since been released on the film's physical media. According to John Dahl, this theatrical ending is the only one in which Rusty Nail survives. The others would have shown the killer nearly getting caught but getting shot to death instead, one where he blows up his truck from the shootout, one where he kills himself, and even one where the police discover a huge stash of bodies in the back of his truck before killing him. You know, I think the theatrical ending with him still being out there is the best one. And it's a shame that it was a bit of a waste as the Joyride sequel released in 2008 called Joyride Dead Ahead and the later third installment Joyride Roadkill were released straight to video and never really saw any kind of acclaim. Have you seen them? What did you think of them? Let me know down below. In the end, the movie offers a chilling mystery and fun early 2000s characters to sink your teeth into. If you're in the mood for a gritty thriller with a kick-ass soundtrack and some great visuals, check out Joyride. Just make sure your seatbelts are securely fastened first.